earlier today, I spoke to Stephen O'Brien, who's the UN Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, and I began by asking him how the world can sit idle while genocide unfolds in Aleppo. I think we need to be cautious uh, about using words like genocide or immediately trying to say who's to blame. We're in a very live situation where for many years, and indeed in recent weeks, the United Nations humanitarians and their implementing partners in the local NGOs and local people have been working feverishly to try and reach people in desperate need of food, shelter, medicines, treatments. But nothing has sure. changed. This is the problem. This has been several years, as you said, almost six years now, actually, of civil war in Syria. It's really only been in the last couple of weeks that we've seen this big uptake in the, in the regime action and Russian action in Aleppo itself. I'm, I'm wondering about the, the UN in particular. Is the UN now defunct of purpose, given the fact that it has failed to act to save these people? Well, I think if you were to ask many people in eastern Aleppo, let alone in the rest of Syria, look, whatever we do is never going to be sufficient. But there have been extraordinarily brave and courageous UN and humanitarian partners, many of whom have lost their lives as well as been injured, who have saved millions upon millions of lives over this course of the Syrian uh, terrible civil war. And so, yes, it's always going to be insufficient because the scale of what we're faced with is so huge. But the regime but is now dropping leaflets. The regime is now dropping leaflets on the civilians in eastern Aleppo, telling them that the world has forgotten you, the world is ignoring you. Are, are they right? Are these 200 odd thousand people just sitting ducks waiting to be killed? They haven't been forgotten because, of course, I'm not only having this interview, I've been making these points for years, uh, well, the last 18 months, and certainly at uh, the Security Council. The question is, there is always only a political solution in order to stop besiegement and attacks and violence and death and bombs. But in the meantime, the humanitarians are the ones who are bravely reaching people and trying to reach people to secure agreement for safe passage, to secure the money from the donations from the taxpayers that are watching this program uh, that you're broadcasting. Okay. They are the ones who give us the means to do it. But to start attacking the United Nations uh, humanitarians, who are the ones who are actually reaching people, I think you'd get a very different answer if you actually asked some of the people in Aleppo, the millions of people in Aleppo, whose lives have been saved because of the brave and courageous uh, United Nations. I, as I say, this is not sufficient because not enough people have been saved. But I think to suddenly say, just as this is happening, that the United Nations, the highest body in the world with no alternative, in order to try and find some resolution between these terrible disputes which break out between non-state actors as well as states is now defunct. Do you it's have a really plan, though? Smart. Is there is there a, a plan of action? You mentioned there about speaking to people directly in Aleppo. We were speaking to a group called Doctors Under Fire just last week, and they were saying that they have a plan. They, they know what they want. They want no-fly zones. They want aerial aid drops. Uh, they want safe channels of, uh, of passage for aid and for people. Does the United Nations have a, a, a proactive plan that can actually be implemented before we see the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of more people? People. Not only do we have a four-point plan, which has been agreed by the armed opposition groups, but not by Russia and not by the government of Syria at the moment. We have had many plans which have been agreed by the other sides at times and in many other places, as well as Aleppo and in other countries, uh, in Yemen, in South Sudan, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Lake Chad Basin. But what does matter is to recognize that there's a massive difference between, particularly given the scale we're dealing with, uh, of wanting things to happen. And, of course, we all want safe passage. We demand safe passage. That's part of the impartial, independent and neutral humanitarian principles and law that we can demand that of member states. They don't have to agree, but we demand it. But we do need to make sure we can get our lorry drivers, uh, not only to load the lorries, but to get in the cabs and to drive, and that they are not uh, suicidal. They are certainly brave, okay. but they're not suicidal. And we had 20 of them killed. Uh, very recently, as they were trying to deliver that aid. Do you personally feel let down by the politics? I know that there would be very much less humanitarian need in the world if the politics at both local level and at the highest international level were working. Let's talk about numbers. 16,000 people, we understand, have been displaced so far in eastern Aleppo in this conflict. There are several hundred thousand people still remaining there. These people want to leave. They are currently trapped. If they do try to get out, do they have anywhere safe to go? Are they safest, in effect, under regime control? It's now about 20,000 who have fled, and it's about 200,000, we estimate, still stuck in eastern Aleppo. And the main flight is to the west, into western Aleppo. And we have about uh, pre-positioned food for 40,000, and there are places where 
uh, UN and humanitarian partners, including NGOs and others, are in a position to re receive uh, people where they choose to come to. But of course, part of what is humanitarian is people must be free to go where they wish, not to be corralled into places which are effectively further entrapment.